in biology, we if we're going to save a species that's endangered, what we know is we have to save the habitat that's matched to that species. Correct? And that's true of the human species. If we want to if we want to save the human species from all this chronic illness, what we have to do is we have to figure out what is required by that species in terms of eating and moving and thinking. And then we have to get people to match their lifestyle habits with what their genes require to express health. Hey, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. This is part two with one of the biggest influences on my own thinking, my own paradigm of understanding human health, and that is Dr. James Chestnut. If you haven't already, make sure you go back to part one. You listen to the first episode I did with Dr. Chestnut, because in that episode, he outlines in, in a must listen or must watch episode, he outlines what I think is the most important and profound insights to have a sophisticated and intelligent foundational paradigm of understanding human health. This is, in my opinion, uh, one of the premier educators, teachers out there on really understanding human health and what's going on with modern humans and why we have these health problems and how to fix them. He, in my opinion, has a paradigm that explains what's going on and how to fix it better than pretty much anybody on the planet. I don't think I've found anybody on the planet who understands that paradigm in a better way than Dr. Chestnut. So these are must listen episodes. If you care about your health, listen to these episodes, share them with your family, uh, this is a man who I, I consider to be one of the biggest influences on my own personal thinking. And I think that if you don't listen to these episodes, uh, you are doing an enormous disservice to yourself because I think I consider these personally to be among the most important podcasts that I've ever done to date. So with no further ado, enjoy part two of this podcast unless you have not listened to part one yet, in which case go do that first. But if you have, carry on with part two, and there will most likely be a part three and part four with Dr. Chestnut possibly coming as well. So let me know how you enjoy this episode, and I hope you glean a lot of insight from it. Okay, Dr. Chestnut, welcome back to part two. Thank you so much for doing two episodes. I just love your work so much, I, I and it's been a huge influence on me. I, I have to do at least two episodes, and I suspect <laughs> hopefully there'll be more in the future. Yeah, I'd love um, to hear a great interviewer. So your, your, your latest book, which I read in preparation for this podcast, is Live Right for Your Species Type. I had read uh, your four or five other books previously many years ago. And uh, again, as I said before, they had a huge influence on my thinking. I'm deeply forever grateful for your work because of that. Um, and now I've read your new book. It's much more accessible, I think, to the general public. And uh, it's great stuff, as always. So. First of all, the title of your book is Live Right for Your Species Type. What does that mean? And, and how does that mesh with what we were talking about in, in the first podcast around looking at humans from the perspective of a biologist? Right. So, so in biology, um, that's, the, that's biological law, is that every species has a certain... Um, uh, certain requirements that are required for the health of that species. They have to eat certain foods, they have to exercise or move around in a certain way, and they have to socially interact or avoid social interaction, uh, depending on the species, in certain ways. And that's all matched. That's all species specific. So every species on earth, um, every member of that species has the same genome. So people have probably heard of the human genome. But so that means that all humans are so genetically similar to each other that you could take any human from today and take a, a, a sperm or egg from any human today and match it with a sperm or egg from any human over the last 20,000 years and produce a healthy human offspring. That's how genetically similar we are. When, 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 when sperm and, and egg meet, the sperm has half the DNA and the egg has half the DNA. That's, that's, that's what they, they're, they're haploid cells are called. So they're, they have half the DNA and they meet and join together. They literally two half cells from two living things come together and they create a single cell. And that is, that is called a zygote. And that is literally 
all of the DNA that will ever exist in that human being. E every other cell, and there, that's one single cell. And that human being will eventually have 100 trillion cells. That's 100 million million cells, which, by the way, are dividing by the millions per second throughout the lifetime. You can imagine how many cells are actually produced in a human lifetime. And all of the DNA in all of those cells are photocopies of that first cell. Hmm. That first cell has a genome called the human genome. That human genome means that you are distinctly human. You don't come across another species and go, I wonder if that was human. Humans are very easily identified as the human species. You don't come across a giraffe and go, I wonder if that's a giraffe. So every species has, every member of every species has the same genome and genome is what determines species. But here's what the genome has on it. Here's what all the genes have, this DNA. They have all the recipes and the ingredients lists and the cooking instructions for every bit of structure and function that will ever be expressed by any member of that species. Some people call it the blueprint. I call it the recipe book because if we go further down this analogy, it makes it easier to understand than a blueprint, in my opinion. But um, so that that's that's what the genome has on it. It has all of the blueprints for human structure and function. And so the only so it has all the ingredients lists. And that ingredients list are the things that are required by the genes in your cells in order to make proper structure and function. And if you're missing any of those things, or if you're putting poisons or toxins in, then your cells cannot produce, produce healthy cell function or healthy structure and function. So the reason why it's so important to live right for your species type is because your species type is determined by your genome and your genome is what determines what food you need to eat, how much you need to exercise, and how you need to socially interact with other members of your species. And that's true of all species, but it's especially true uh, in this case of the human species. So once you get that, then what you realize is the reason people are sick is because they're not living according to what their species requires. They're not eating with what is, they're not providing the nutrients that are on the ingredients list of their genes. They're not moving and providing the, the, the fitness uh, or physical movement stimuli nutrients that are required from their genes. They're not socially interacting or thinking in ways that are required by their genes in order to express healthy, a healthy, happy life. And so in biology, we if we're going to save a species that's endangered, what we know is we have to save the habitat that's matched to that species, correct? And that's true of the human species. If we want to, if we want to save the human species from all this chronic illness, what we have to do is we have to figure out what is required by that species in terms of eating and moving and thinking. And then we have to get people to match their lifestyle habits with what their genes require to express health. You wrote something in your book that was a, a couple of sentences that I really liked. You said, uh, what's happened to our common sense and logic? If a dog gets sick, we ask what it ate to make it sick. If a child gets sick, we ask what drug we should give the child. So what, what, what does that mean? And I know this, this speaks to a lot of what we talked about in part one, but what, 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 do, you, what do you mean by that? Why, why, what's wrong with that? Well, I think that because we've been we've been brought up in a paradigm that is uh, a health paradigm, which is really a sickness paradigm, which is all based on the idea that if humans are sick, it's because they're defective. Um, and therefore, you need a pill or you need an expert to get you well. Right. So uh, we, are, we are totally focused on what sickness do I have? What's the treatment? But when we look at animals or plants, or like you talked about in, 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 the, in the first one with the plant analogy, what we think about is what's required for that thing to be healthy? See, we're asking the wrong question. And so, and we, and we, and we're, so if you ask the, if you just ask the different question, what's required for a human being to be healthy? And I, I, I often do this when I lecture to the lay public, I'll say, I would like everybody to write down and, and your audience can do this now, just like write down five things that you know are required for a human being to be healthy. Right. And what would most people write down, Ari? They'd write down, you know, water, they should exercise, you know, they should eat healthy food, probably some fruits and vegetables in there. Um, they probably say they should love themselves and others. They should have some form of social connection. I mean, these are all things that I think most people would write down. Would you agree, Ari? Absolutely. How many people would write down drugs or chemotherapy mm. or, or surgery? Mm. Right. 
And so that that's my point. My point is, is that if you just ask a different question, what do I need to be well and express health? And those things, the answer to those are the same as this. It's the same answer as if you're saying, what do I need to prevent sickness? The things that you need to prevent sickness are the things that you need to produce health because sickness is a lack of health. Right. And so, but if your question is, what am I sick with? How do I treat it? Uh, it's very hard to produce health from that. Whatever answer you give, no matter how correct the answer is, whatever answer you get from that question is never going to produce health or prevent sickness. And that's the paradigm that people operate in, which is, and by the way, they apply that almost uniquely to humans, animals, we're at animals, mammals, but they don't seem to apply that to, to, to the rest of biology because humans have been taught from a very early age that they're not part of biology. You know, like I, I took a lot of biology courses and a lot of physiology courses, and I can tell you, you can study the biology. And again, I was, as I've said, I've taken a lot of, I've been in school, I was in school a long time. And you can study the biology of a single cell amoeba in the same class as a primate. But if you want to study human physiology or human biology, you go to a different class. If you, you you'll see things like um, no animals allowed in a restaurant and it's full of humans, you'll see things like, you know, this COVID virus jump from an animal to a human. Well, that's jumping from an animal to an animal. By the way, it didn't, but you, you get me, right? Yeah. So, so, so we've been programmed to see ourselves as separate from nature, as being somehow humans have a different set of physiological laws or biological laws that apply to the health and sickness of humans than any other species on earth. That's a lie. Yeah. But once you realize that, if you get that, then what you would do is you would ask the right question. We go, well, what I, what do I need to be healthy? And if I'm sick, what am I not doing that I should be? Or what am I doing that I shouldn't be? Very simple questions because as I've said, all sickness is in all living things is caused by only two things, toxicities, something toxic is being put into that ecosystem. That's what humans are. We're ecosystems of cells. That's what all living things are. Or deficiency. You're not putting something in that your genome or your cells or, or your genes require to genetically express healthy structure and function. So there's only two causes to all illnesses and all things. Something toxic's going in or something that you require isn't going in at all or not going in at a sufficient amount. Mm -hmm. And there, that is it. Yeah. I promise you. And by the way, a thought can be negative. Trauma can be toxic. If you, if you, when you apply it properly, that rule is a biological law. You know, it, it, it's interesting. It's such an aha moment for me to look at things from this perspective, because I realized that I've been doing it my whole life since I was a little kid. Um, and there are two main reasons why one is your work. And the other one was before I read your work, when I was a, when I was a teenager, I got really into aquariums mm. and, um, I just, my obsessive nature, I went very quickly from, you know, basic freshwater aquariums, then saltwater aquariums. And then I, uh, got into live coral reef aquariums. And then I started to, because I came, became so obsessed with it, I uh, started working in a coral reef aquarium shop in San Diego and, um, and basically just studied that stuff. My, those were my two passions, coral reef, corals and coral reefs and marine biology and um, human physiology and fitness and bodybuilding. And so I wasn't interested in school. I just wanted to study those two topics all the time, but I had my own coral reef aquarium and um, I could see when corals died or when fish died, it was for very simple reasons. And those, those were easily identifiable reasons. Those fish didn't die and those corals didn't die when the conditions, the environmental conditions were optimal, when the lighting was optimal, when the water quality was optimal, um, when they were being fed the proper diet, and if one of those things was off, things would start dying. So I spent years and years and years just tinkering with a natural ecosystem or semi-natural ecosystem um, and getting to see and measure how different changes and inputs and if I would be lazy and didn't take care of changing the water um, uh, at, at regular intervals or if I wasn't feeding the proper diet to fish, things would start to get sick and die. And this for me was a lesson in exactly what you're talking about. And I think this, this whole paradigm is actually very simple. 
again, the analogy of a house plant or the analogy you gave in, in part one of, you know, fish dying and birds dying in the lake. And, you know, you don't set up a hospital and start giving all the fish and, and birds drugs. You look at the environment and try to figure out what's causing all this illness and correct it at that level. Um, and as you say, we're really, humans are really bad, circa 2023, at applying this very basic common sense logic to ourselves. And that is the big problem. Yeah, I, I mean, brilliant. And, and and what you knew in your aquarium, Ari, um, intuitively, was that that the health healthy meant as 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 natural as possible mimicking nature as closely as possible and what you were really doing was trying to set up environments that were that were uh equivalent to allowing whatever species were living in that aquarium to live right for their species type that's right you were doing that all your life yeah you just didn't have that name to it yeah exactly but 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 something just dawned on me on what you're saying which i think might be helpful to, to your to your audience and that is that you know, when we use the analogies of the plant or the fish in the Great Lakes or, or, or any species, right? One of the things that biologists, one of the variables that biologists can remove in terms of the cause of illness in animals, other than human animals, is they don't assume that they are engaging in suicidal behaviors. Mm. So yeah. they're not worried that the, that the animals are going and eating uh, hydrogenated fat. Mm -hmm. or 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 sugar or high fructose corn syrup or that they're going to sit around all day instead of move mm -hmm. in other words what they can assume just like we can assume of our ancestors right mm -hmm. is that the animals are not faced in a healthy environment they're not faced with a bunch of unhealthy choices their only their, their only options are the choices that they've that they're that they're that, that are congruent with their genome that are that are that represent living right for your species type and they are taught Mammals are taught from a very early age what to eat and what not to eat, correct? But the things not to eat are either usually dangerous or they don't taste good or, you know what I mean? They don't have PhD chemists trying to figure out how to make monkeys want to eat things that'll kill them, <laughs> right? Yeah. But in humans, what we've created is we've created an environment for ourselves that that is that is absolutely so tempting, that is so far beyond the human genome's ability of self-control and to resist temptation, because that's not how we genetically uh, evolved, right? We didn't require huge amounts of self-control when our genome became human because there wasn't all of these other unhealthy temptations available to us. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is based on the idea of profit is we've created agriculture and so-called food and so-called entertainment. We've created all of these things in the name of profit that, that, that basically are predatory on other humans and rely on the fact that humans don't have a genetic defense against these temptations. Mm -hmm. Right. We only have a psychological defense and that must be developed. We're not born with it. Right. The skills required to navigate life in the industrial world to live right for your species type are not innate. They're learned. Mm -hmm. And so and even worse, as, as you've alluded to earlier, Ari, is that we are also brainwashed from an early age. And we are taught and we are, and so most people learn the exact opposite of, of what's required to be well. They learn to take the pill. They learn to rely on somebody else for their health. They, they learn that they're defective. If they're sick, it's, 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 you should look inward, not outward to your choices. So imagine putting all that together. If you were an evil person and you wanted to create sickness in a species, and particularly the human species, what you would do is you would create an environment that was so full of unhealthy temptations and so full of education to make people make the wrong choice once they're, once they're suffering the consequences of, of, of succumbing to those predatory temptations. I mean, just next time you go into the grocery store or the corner store, pay attention to where the candy is. Mm -hmm. It's at eye level for kids, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Just pay attention to what's in the aisles and at the end of the aisle, and just think about how hard it is to find food. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my 
what I consider to be one of my mo most sort of uh, insightful and, and perhaps humorous lines is I remember I was uh, speaking to a very large audience in a theater one time and someone put up their hand and said, Dr. Chestnut, you know, you know, how do you read labels? Like, how do we supposed to read a label? And I simply said, well, I'll tell you what, if it's got a label on it, it ain't food. Mm -hmm. And everybody laughed for a second. And then everyone went, you know what? That's a pretty good rule. <laughs> and so if you think about that, if you only ate things that didn't have a label on it, mm -hmm. I call it the label free diet, you know, TM, you know what I mean? I should probably yeah. write a book. Yeah. I just don't have time. But, but, but just imagine if you lived a label free diet, if you ate a label free diet, how much better would that be? Enormously better. Enormously. Yeah. And so why? Because it's, it's, it's a predatory temptation, unhealthy temptation, free diet. 100%. Right. Okay. So, it, so in live right for your species type in your new, in your new book, uh, you talk a lot about genes and genetic expression. Yes. What is the, and, and one thing you say towards the beginning of the book is the state of genetic expression determines the state of health or illness. So define for people, what is the distinction between the genes that they have versus their genetic expression. And what do you mean by the state of genetic expression determines the state of health or illness? Okay. So, so state of health is a state of function, structure and function, right? So, so if you're unhealthy, you have unhealthy cells. If you're healthy, you have healthy cells. And what does that mean? It means all the different cells that have, by the way, the cells in your body are all genetically identical, but have very different structure and functions based on which genes in those cells are being expressed, which I'll get back to in a second. But basically health is structure and function. So if you have healthy structure and function, you're healthy. If you have sick structure and function, you, you, you're sick. So the question is what determines structure and function? And the thing that determines structure and function, now what determines what, what kind of, in other words, your, the genes that you have determine that you can only express human structure and function. Right. But whether, but whether, but the quality of that structure and function isn't determined by the genes that you possess, it's determined by which genes you are expressing. So, for a long time, when people study genes, they used to wash off this protein code on the outside so they could look at what they thought was the important part, which was the genes, that double helix, you know, that famous double helix of Watson and Crick. But what they realized later was what they were washing off was what's called the epigenome. Mm. And the epigenome is this coding that goes around the genes. Now, remember, the genes are a recipe book, okay? So what the gene epigenome does is it determines which pages are available to be copied and taken to the kitchen, okay? So, so what the epigenome does is it turns the pages, depending on the configuration of that epigenome, it determines which genes can be expressed. And maybe the best way to explain this very simply, Ari, is to say... We can all agree that all our, our cells are genetically identical, correct? Because they all came from, they're all copies of that original cell that we had. So every cell in our body. So imagine this, your, the cells that make up your teeth are genetically identical to the cells that make up your eyes, which are genetically identical to the cells that make up your heart, which spontaneously depolarize, which are genetically ad identical to the cells that are in your intestines, that are identical to the ones that are in your pancreas and produce insulin that are identical to the ones in your bone marrow that produce red blood cells, that are genetically identical to your neurons that produce electricity. So if you were to look at cells, right, under a microscope, and you look at a neuron, you, you remember, Ari, what a neuron looks like, right? It's got that dendrite and all those things off it, or a heart cell that it's deployed. Like if you looked at the different cells of the body in a, under a microscope, and it, not in a million years would you assume that those things are genetically identical because they have such different structure and function. Okay, which proves that the genes that those cells possess do not determine the structure and function which they're expressing. What determines what they're, the structure and function that they're expressing is which genes they're expressing at that moment. So eye cells are expressing eye cell function and structure genes. All the rest of those genes are in those cells, but they're being covered up by that epigenome coat. Mm -hmm. And if they're covered up, they cannot be transcribed or copied and taken to the kitchen, which is the ribosomes and the cytoplasm of the cell for people who, are, who follow it. So if you go to a bone cell, the bone cell has all the genes in there for eye structure and function, 
but those ones are being covered up by the epigenome and what's being expressed are the ones for bone cell structure and function. F easy enough to understand? Yeah. Okay. So what we now know is what we've now proven in the study of epigenetics now proven beyond any shadow of a doubt is that we know that it's the genes that you're expressing that determine your, your state of structure and function, whether it's healthy or sick, not the genes you're possessing. The genes you possess determine that you can only express human structure and function. But whether or not you're expressing healthy or sick is based on which particular genes you're expressing. And which particular genes you're expressing isn't controlled by which genes you have, right? Which page the, the recipe book is turned to and therefore which recipe gets cooked up at the kitchen isn't controlled by the recipe book. The recipe book is just a passive source of information it has all the recipes and the ingredients list in it, and that's what your genome is. So that genome, your genes that you possess, have the recipe books, the ingredients list. But who's the who's the master chef? The master chef is your organ of self-regulation, your subconscious brain. So if you look at, at these variables that determine health, the genes you possess, obviously, because you can't express one you don't have. Um, the kitchen itself. You know, do you have a good kitchen to bake up these recipes properly to create the proteins and the hormones and all these other things? Do you have a good master chef that knows which recipe to create based on environmental demand? All of those three things, Ari, have been perfected over millennia of natural selection. We don't have faulty chefs. We don't have bad recipes and we don't have faulty ingredients lists. Correct. All those things are basically constants. So they can't be the thing that can determine whether you can be healthy and sick, healthy and sick. And we all know that our health can change throughout our lifetime. The one thing that is plastic, that is not constant, is whether or not those ingredients are supplied. The shopper is the thing that determines which genes we express, which habitat we shop for, and which choices we make within that habitat are the only thing, is the only variable that determines health that's, that's not constant. Correct, because all the other things are part of the are part of the genome, right? They're constant. Your genome doesn't change throughout your lifetime, but the shopper, right? What foods we eat, how we eat, how we move, how we think, how we socially interact, what environments we choose to live in—that's the variable that determines our state of genetic expression, and it's our state of genetic expression that determines our states of structure and function. So that's why I say our physiology, which is our state of structure and function, is the epigenetic expression of our habitat and lifestyle. Okay, so a, a, a couple small points. I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but um, just to make sense of this for people, there is such a thing as um, a true genetic disease, for example, a Down syndrome or, or something to that effect. And it is also the case that certain genes, genetic variants of a particular gene relative to another variant that someone else might have might increase one's susceptibility to a particular disease more so than uh, someone else, whether it's diabetes, breast cancer with the BRCA gene or um, the obesity gene or you know so on and so forth. We've had yeah. many decades of media publications around the obesity gene or the breast cancer gene and, and various other genes that are uh, linked with increased risk of getting a particular disease. So uh, make sense of that piece of this story relative to what you were just talking about. Okay. So anybody who tells you that you have a gene that makes you more susceptible to something is telling you that it's not a genetic illness by definition. Mm -hmm. A genetic illness, and they exist, there's about, about 2%. By the way, that's across all species. You know, um, uh, Genetic illnesses do exist, but, but a genetic illness is defined by by very strict criteria that is if you have the gene you have the illness there's nobody that with a genetic illness right that doesn't have the gene that determines that genetic illness right there's no other variable if you have like down syndrome if you have an extra 21st chromosome you have down syndrome period so this, this idea of susceptibility the only thing you're genetically susceptible to is health and the way i describe that best i think is with the hangover gene like the obesity gene is so absurd because who was, who was obese in, in 1750? Because it's the human genome has not changed at all, right? Yeah. It's like saying, well, you know, uh, Hispanic and black people have, have more susceptibility to diabetes and obesity. Well, really, how many people were obese in Africa? Mm -hmm. How many people were obese in, in, in Mexico or Spain? 
In fact, there, I mean, it, it, it's, it's absurd, right? And, and so, so again, it, it's just, it, but the best way to explain that is this, because I, I, I will explain very downstream illness in a second, how there's some individuality, but, but think of this. So there's a hangover gene, right? Which they've identified. I always say I must've gotten two, but anyway, <laughs> if, if, if there's a hangover, gene, first of all, that hangover gene would, would, would have to be, think about it. Why would there be a hangover gene if if human genes evolved before we are consuming alcohol? But but put that aside for a second. Let's say I have the hangover gene. Okay. Does that mean I have hangovers all the time? Nope. Nope. I would have to expose my my ecosystem to alcohol in order to get a hangover. Is that true? Yeah. So is it the gene? Or is it the alcohol? It's the alcohol. Correct. That's susceptibility argument refuted in two seconds yeah but I, but i will tell you this um first of all even when they talk about allele, alleles and things if if a particular illness that they are attributing to an allele like this methylation stuff that that, that happens quite a bit, um well those alleles have been around for centuries for actually millennia and the illnesses that people are associating with those things are exponentially increasing and the genetic stockpile of the people that they say are to blame for this, you know, uh, those people never had the illnesses a hundred years ago that they're expressing now, but they had the alleles. So is it the allele? Nope. It's something else going on. Right. So, so now let's go to, um, downstream. So once you understand why people get sick and if you understand it's not bad genes or genetic defects or inability to self-regulate, it's stressors, it's unhealthy lifestyle, it's stressors. Once stressors have been around a long time, right? It becomes very metabolically expensive to be in the stress response all the time. And you start to get fatigue. Your pancreas gets tired. It can't produce as much insulin. You get diabetes. All of these other things start to occur. You know, the inflammation has been around a long time. You get arthritis, you get atherosclerotic changes, uh, you, your high blood sugar, in your diet, and you've been sedentary. You start to get obesity. Like these things all come from chronic exposure to things that are toxic and deficient. Now, far downstream from all those toxicities and deficiencies that have been around long enough to actually create fatigue and chronic illness, way downstream, you may have some individuality of what specific illness you develop, right? So some people might have, you know, overeat and eat unhealthy food and do all these things and they end up with cancer, right? And the other person might end up with, with, with uh, you know, diabetes or heart disease. But that's not because but but the but but the things that made them individuals way down the line there are not to blame for what why they have heart disease or cancer any more than the person with the hangover should blame the hangover gene what's to blame is all the chronic stress they've been under and the poor eating moving and thinking and not living right for their species type that went on for decades before they developed that end stage illness mm -hmm. correct yeah so those end stage illnesses are 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 not are not um, genetically individual illnesses. They all had the common denominator of decades of toxicity and deficiency before you can get a chronic illness. You can't get those chronic illnesses without that toxicity and deficiency. Therefore, those same people with those same genes, even, even if five years into their bad lifestyle that was leading to cancer or diabetes or whatever else, even if we changed their lifestyle at that point, them having the same genes, no changes, but if we change their lifestyle, what happens to their chance of those illnesses? It goes way down. Of course. So it's not the gene. It's not the genes you're born with. You're not defective, ladies and gentlemen. Please understand that. You're not born defective. What's defective is your ability to cope with the predatory temptation that our industrial world has allowed to be legal. It's legal to tempt kids with candy at the, at the store and tell them it's food. They sell it with the food stuff. It's, it's, it's legal to have slot machines and gambling and pornography. And all, these are all legal things that we've decided and drugs and all the other stuff. So, so the, the defects are in our behavior and the reasons our behaviors are defect defective is because we have defective knowledge or we have defective self-control to implement that knowledge into our lives. But knowledge can be overcome with education and effective self-control can be overcome with training and mm -hmm. exercises. So, so we all have all the potential we require genetically and, and, and even psychologically, we have all the potential we need 
to be psychologically fit and to make and identify good choices. Um, but we need training because some of the things that we require, remember, we're the shopper. And becoming a good shopper requires education and self-control. I have about a million things more that I want to talk to you about. And uh, I think we may have to do a part three and a part <laughs> four to cover them all. Um, so I want to be selective about what I offer um, for discussion here uh, in the remainder of time we have allotted, which you've generously um, given in your schedule. So in your book, you say the, th the three most important variables for determining your health destiny are number one, knowledge of the human genome determined essential ingredients that you're responsible to supply. Number two, knowledge of the human genome determined toxins you're responsible to avoid. And number three, as you were just speaking to, the self-control and integrity needed to consistently behave according to this knowledge. What, what are these um, human genome determined essential ingredients we have to supply and human genome determined toxins we're responsible to avoid? How does this link up with your big paradigm, which I have loved for 15 plus years now since I first read your work around deficiencies and toxicities. What are these key deficiencies and toxicities? What is that story all about? Okay, so our, our genome evolved or was created, it doesn't matter, or a combination of both doesn't really matter to me, but I'm just saying we have this genome and our genome determines what foods we're supposed to eat. Like giraffes have a giraffe diet. And if they vary from that diet, they get sick you know, water buffalo have a water buffalo diet. If they, if they, if they go away from that diet, they get sick. Humans have the human diet. And if we move away from the human diet, we get sick. What, what is the human diet? The human diet means we have things that are called essential nutrients and essential means that are, they're required for healthy structure and function, but our bodies can't make them. So things like vitamins and minerals, essential fatty acids, uh, you know, uh, uh, probiotics, you know, that's why I created my essential nutrient system. What I, what I said was there's, there's two things. One is if our body requires it, that can't make it. And two, that we can't easily get it from, from a, from a pretty easy dietary change. Right. So there are some things that require a lot of work to get, even though we could get them from a diet, but there are a lot of work and they're not really available anymore. Um, and there's some things that our bodies just make, so we shouldn't take those. And then there are some things that are essential that we really, really require, but are kind of harder to get. So those are worth supplementing. That's why I created that. But, but basically humans, and again, it doesn't matter where you live or we don't all have to eat the same foods already. We all have to get the same nutrients. So when we lived in Africa as humans, early humans, when we started moving out of Africa, we required the same nutrients when we were living in, in the Arctic. But we weren't going to get our vitamin C from, from citrus fruit in the Arctic. We were going to have to eat seal skin where we could take that collagen and make vitamin C out of it. We weren't going to get our essential fatty acids from wild, big, large, wild game. We were going to get it from eating seal blubber. Um, so, so what we had to do as humans through trial and error is wherever we moved into a new habitat, what we had to figure out was how could we extract the essential nutrients we require from that habitat? And that's what we did, or we didn't survive, period. We got sick. The other thing we had, uh, the other thing that's very essential for humans, that's eat well, is moving well. So, so, so that's, that's eat well, those nutrients, but, but, but moving well is there's, there, moving is our, uh, is an essential nutrient for human beings. We, not, not just our physical bodies, but our brains require movement. Spark by Rady is one of the best books you could ever re read on this. Just a fantastic book explaining it. Um, and I use it a lot to explain to chiropractors why they're having such an impact when they're getting these joints moving, then teach people to go home and keep them moving. But um, so, so movement is a required nutrient. It's not just that it keeps you thin. It's not just that it makes you fit and look good. It's that literally we know that if we remove, um, you know, daily exercise from a human being, even who's an Olympic athlete, they immediately start to move towards insulin resistance, bone loss, uh, depression. I mean, it's incredible. So these are, you have to see exercise as an essential nutrient to produce healthy structure and function. It's a genome requirement that we move a lot all day. I and mean, we're supposed to take all of our joints through full range of motion against resistance on a daily basis. That's really what humans require to express healthy structure and function. And then the other one is think well. And there are essential nutrients that humans require. Humans, because we're social mammals and we, we evolved in packs or tribes, we require other humans to be healthy. We require social interaction. We require 
uh, social acknowledgement that we're that that we're contributing and that we're valuable. We we, we require um, self esteem. We require gratitude and and all of these things that. So if you take any social mammal like a wolf or even a dog, um, and you remove it from its ability to to interact with other mammals of its of its species or tribe, it will get sick very quickly. Similarly, if you take a solitary mammal, like a grizzly bear, and make it live with other grizzly bears, it will literally go into this amazing stress response. It will froth at the mouth. I mean, it's incredible. Even when they're doing it just to catch salmon, they're so freaked out. So, so genetically, we are we as humans, we are we are social mammals, and we require love and interaction, and we require social acceptance. Um, which is which is why bullying and hate and these things and and division are so make people sick it makes them murderous and angry and depressed and anxious if you if you it's it, division does this not not being accepted by your fellow humans or feeling like other humans are inferior or superior to you um right so so if we live in a small tribe you can think that the other tribe's not as good but we don't live in small tribes anymore. We live in giant tribes. And so you need the acceptance of everyone you kind of consider to be in your tribe, which is basically everybody, mm -hmm. right? So uh, these are all essential nutrients that we that that we require. So without those things, or if we're put, so those are the sufficiency, uh, you know, we, you know, because if deficiency makes you sick, then sufficiency is what's required to be well. If toxicity makes you sick, then purity is what you need to be well. So the, the toxins that we need to avoid are toxic foods, Toxic movement patterns like being sedentary or constant repetitive stress trauma, toxic thoughts, negative thoughts about ourselves or others, hatred, division. These are all the toxicities that we live with. They could be a toxic thing like getting run over by a car. That's literally it would be described as a toxic because it's so toxic to your body. And so these are the things that we require and we, and we require the knowledge of what things our body and our cells need to express healthy structure and function. We need to know what things we need to be sufficient in, and we need to know which things are toxic to us so we can avoid them. Then, after we have that knowledge, Ari, we have to have the ability and the self-control to apply that knowledge to our daily choices because habits are what determine our health. It's our habits that, you know, health health is habit, is, is, is based on your habits. Your long-term habits determine your long-term health. Elaborate a bit more on this paradigm of deficiencies on toxicities. Just just build this out for people so people can uh, really, really get it. So we got basically the way that you explain how do we op like how, if I ask you the question, how do we improve our health and prevent disease and maximize our lifespan, maximize our health span? Right. What is your simple high level overview of the answer to that question eat move and think according to your species type so so in other words you have to eat the foods that supply the nutrients your cells need and you need to avoid the toxic things like high fructose corn syrup food additives you know the antibiotics they put in the meat the the you know the high the the the, the processed carbohydrates all the things that are toxic to you you have to avoid because they make you sick and by the way, when, you know, going back to our discussion in part one about, you know, the side effects of drugs, the reason drugs have side effects is because they're toxic. Mm -hmm. And so they represent a toxicity. You can never get healthy from a toxicity, even if it changes a blood score number or a blood test number, you, you can't. And so that's why drugs are by definition toxins, literally by definition. And so, and in terms of our, our, our of, of, of exercise, if you're deficient in what your body needs, that's a stressor. If you're, if you're putting toxic movement stimulation in or not enough, like, you know, toxic by sedentary or toxic by repetitive stress, that's a stressor. Your brain literally will go into the stress response. Just like if you eat toxic foods, it causes a stress because your cells aren't able to operate properly and your brain detects that as a stressor. Then it produces inflammation, it produces the high cortisol levels, all these things, right, that are causing you down the road to end up with high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, obesity, depression, anxiety, infertility, low sex drive, indigestion, all of these things come from toxic, um, from to chronic toxicity and deficiency that you, that, that turn into the physiological stress response that turn into risk factors that turn into chronic disease that kill you. 
Okay. I'm going to be careful with my last couple questions here because I know we got to go soon. I, I'm hoping you'll do a part three with me and I'll, I'll, sure, I'd love to. I'll make your, your time worthwhile, I promise. <laughs> it's um, always worthwhile. This is great. <laughs> so, You're like me, I'm sure, Ari, right? Is that this is so important to you and so part of who you are mm -hmm. that the idea of having a venue that more people who might not hear it could hear it is not a burden. It's a privilege. So I do appreciate the interview. You never have to worry about, about the time. And if I have to reschedule because I at a certain slot, that's fine. But I'm always grateful to be able to share what I am so passionate about, as I'm sure you are. Beautiful. Yes, absolutely. 100%. Okay. So um, if I can briefly summarize everything that we've talked about, it would be essentially we've established that humans don't get disease and illness as a result of drug deficiencies and having screwed up genetics. And instead, this is a result of toxicities and deficiencies at the lifestyle level. We are not living according to our species type and providing the optimal inputs at the environment and lifestyle level level for our biology, for our genetics to express in a healthy way that naturally, innately is designed to create health and ward off disease or prevent disease. Is that a good Brilliant. way of summarizing? Brilliant. Okay. Yeah, very, very good. <laughs> okay. So this is, in terms of the healthcare side of this, this is a fundamental shift away from a sickness care paradigm of essentially waiting for people to get a disease that then we could diagnose them with and then using a drug or a surgical intervention, most often a drug intervention to try to fix their disease, which as you've explained so far, doesn't work very well. Um, it's a shift away from that paradigm towards a paradigm of health optimization. And working with the innate intelligence of the human organism in the way that a biologist would if they were examining our species what does this species need to express optimal health how do we create those conditions which is an amazingly simple and obvious way of looking at things and yet is shockingly uncommon i mean i know a million people even in the natural health space even extraordinarily high IQ doctors of various kinds in the natural health space, the functional medicine movement, who just don't seem to look at things in this way. And it's kind yeah, of mind blowing uh, that, that they don't. Um, in your but book, it's not an intelligence issue. It's a paradigm issue, like which is, that's the key. It's the lens through which they're seeing. And some of their fundamental foundational beliefs are wrong, but yeah. that's not because they're not smart. It's because they believe the wrong thing. That's right. They're members of the Flat Earth Society. <laughs> but they but they got a PhD in flat earth. Right. So um, I, you just reminded me of a quote from from Paul Check that I really love. Paul Check. So said you were this, talking about generalist. Yeah. Yeah. So so he described the, what's going on culturally in this increased tendency towards specialization um, among in academia and among clinicians and in, in healthcare. And he said people know more and more about less and less until the point where they know absolutely everything about nothing. Yeah. 100%. And, and I thought that's just such a brilliant way to describe, you or know, they know everything about one thing. Yeah. Yeah, right? exactly. But life isn't one thing. Yeah. You know, human, human health is we're, we're, we're incredibly complex ecosystems of a hundred trillion cells with the comp most complex systems you could imagine. And so, so knowing one thing is almost useless. But yeah. you might know a lot about one thing, but illness is never caused by one thing unless you're standing beside a nuclear bomb. You know what I mean? It's just illness is illness is, is very complicated because it's so multifactorial, but health is really simple. Mm -hmm. Health is simple. Sickness is complicated. Yeah. So um, in your book, you describe a need for a transition in how we view healthcare. Again, away from this sort of sickness care towards health optimization. Those are my words, not yours. Um, and the types of practitioners we see. And you use the analogy of uh, fire departments versus maintenance yeah. contractors. So explain right. that for people. It's funny because um, as, you were, as you were leading up to this, I'm thinking, Matt, I hope I have time to do my fire department analogy. So <laughs> <laughs> like we're, still on the, we're on the same page so much. So anyway, I always use the analogy of like medicine is like the fire department and people like you and I 
who are into wellness and, and lifestyle, we, we are the, we are the sort of the health maintenance contractors. So, so you can imagine that if, you know, if your house is on fire, you know, who should you call? Well, you would call the fire department. And so when the fire department gets there, what, what, what tools do they have? They have axes and fire hoses, drugs and surgery. So what they'll do, they'll come, your house is on fire. They'll smash into your walls. They'll break down all your windows. They'll kick down your door. They'll come inside your house. They'll ax and break into your walls where there's any, any, any smoldering flames. They'll, and they'll spray your house down and they'll completely put out the fire. And then they leave. And what's left? What's left is a house which is in disarray. It's not a healthy house. But the fire's out, so you can be grateful for that. But now that your health is your 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 house is in, is in this disarray, who would you call back to get your house back to health? Would you call back the fire department for more axes and fire hoses, drugs and surgeries? Of course not. You would have to call somebody who's a specialist in getting the house well. The problem we have is the fire department has a monopoly of all the media, of all the healthcare spending, of all the research dollars. And all they say is we need more axes and more fire hoses. All the research has to be on to get better and more axes and fire hoses. We need more fire departments. We need more firemen. We need, you know, like more doctors, more nurses, more hospitals, more fire departments, more drugs, more surgeries, more axes, more fire hoses, because fires are deadly. Mm. And we say, well, yeah, but, but, but axes and fire hoses can't prevent a fire. Well, that doesn't, that's not relevant because wellness, your wellness and maintenance things can't put out a fire. And we would say, but we're not trying to put out fires. What we're trying to say is if you use our, our stuff first, you don't get a fire, at least a fastly reduced risk. And we're not claiming we put out fires. They're saying, yeah, but you know how many fires there are? You know how dangerous fires are? We need more money to put out more fires. There's fires all the time. We're saying, yeah, but the reason there's more fires is because people are unsafe in their houses. They're, they're, you know, they're cooking on campfires in their bloody kitchen, the way they eat, move and think. They're living these like incredibly dangerous lifestyles for their house or their body. And so, and they're saying it, it doesn't matter. Look how many fires are. There's this much heart disease, this much cancer, this much diabetes. We need more money to study fires. And we're saying, stop treating fires. And by the way, you know, why would anybody, why would anybody want to use the fire department to make a healthy house? And so the fire department basically says, well, we can make the wellness contractors look impotent. If they're standing around and there's a fire and we demand from them evidence that they can put out fires, we can show that they're not real scientific healthcare practitioners. But who looks impotent once the fire's out or when you're trying to prevent a fire? If you're there with your contractor materials and you're putting healthy boards in and you're painting it like all the eat, move, think and all the purities and sufficiencies and you're doing all that kind of stuff, who's impotent now if you're standing around with an ax and a fire hose? Mm. Who, who now feels useless about what they can contribute to wellness and prevention? Mm. The problem is what medicine does because of the pharmaceutical lobby. And remember, the people who sell all the axes and fire hoses and build all the fire departments or the hospitals, the drugs and surgeries, are the richest corporations in the world and they own the media. And so they're trying to convince everybody to be scared of fires and to think about how dangerous a fire is and how they want a treatment to put it out instead of thinking about, wait a minute, how do I prevent fires and what do I do after the fire to get better? And so the, what they're doing is they're basically paying the fire department to come and spray their house down regularly. And the truth is the fire department can show with randomized controlled trials that if you spray that house down once a week, you'll never get a fire. Problem is, what's the side effect? Your house rots. Mm -hmm. So all of these drug studies prove that you will you 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 lower the cholesterol, you lower everything else. But problem is, you have side effects. And what what do we know? You're really sick. Your chances of using more drugs later are greater. Your quality of life goes down, and your lifespan is not improved. So why would you use that system? What we need is a fire department that's around, just in case there's a fire. But we need to have a system that's in place to make fires rare exceedingly rare and that's what lifestyle can do but we don't get any of the funding we don't get any of the respect there's no shows on television about lifestyle right maybe 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 some of these shows like the biggest loser or whatever but they're never seen as as interventions or they're, they're right they're seen as like kind of like a you know uh, you know uh reality tv but then you look every, every there's how many shows are there sponsored by pharmaceutical companies that are about doctors or hospitals, or emergency care, because they want the focus to be there. But the reality is what we know for sure is, is that if you really want to make a difference in the quality of life, in the happiness quotient, in the actual health status of a population, 
the answer is not more drugs and surgery. It's better eating, moving, and thinking. That is unequivocally true. For everybody listening, I, I want to say just on a personal note, um, as I emphasized in part one, Dr. Chestnut is in the, the, the probably the single most important thinker as far as health teacher out there in, in my own personal life. And I want you to tag these two podcasts as two of the most important podcasts that I've ever done as far as you grasping the basic, most essential paradigm to understand your own health from. So Dr. Chestnut, um, I want to insist, uh, not that I can insist, but I, I, I almost want to insist here that we do a, a part three, a part four, if you're open to it, what you have to teach is so important. And I would love to share this uh, with as many people as possible and delve into much greater specifics. I still have a long list of questions that we didn't get to. Um, in the meantime, are there any final words you want to leave people with and also tell people where they can follow your work and get your products, learn more from you? Sure. Well, they could go to www.eatwellmovewellthinkwell.com. And I would recommend that at the very least, they sign up for the free newsletters. Um, they don't have to buy anything, but all the supplements are there. The essential nu nutrient system is available there. But, it, but, but at the very least, you know, this, I'm kind of pumping out this information all the time. And I do highly recommend they get the book. It's just a lot of, it's a great resource for the rest of their life. Agreed. And, you know, your genes aren't going to change. So everything that's in there isn't going to change. <laughs> um, and I guess to end, I would, first of all, I'd like to thank you for, uh, I've done a lot of interviews, Ari, and I'd have to say these are the best questions um, so thought out um, and, and led me in a really good direction so that we could, exp I think if people listen to both these interviews and, and I'm very happy to do to do some more. Um, I think they've got exactly what I would have wanted them to get. So I thank you for, for, for your skill set. Um, thank you. and for your kind words, you, you, you know, thank you for that. And that's, uh, always makes me feel great. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, what I would the fact that I'm inviting you on for a part three and a part four is the highest compliment I could possibly. Oh, well, thank you. I, well, I, I accept that as a compliment and I appreciate it. Um, but, but if I could leave your audience with with something it would be this no, number one just understand that you are a genetic superstar that you would not be here unless your all of your ancestors survived meaning that you your genes have been naturally selected over time you're not genetically defective or weak that you are live in a society that makes it hard to develop the knowledge and skills in terms of self-control and integrity required to know what the good choices are and to consistently make those choices. It's really hard if you haven't, if it's not hardened because you lack potential, it's hard because you've lacked the education. And so when you go down this road and I, and, I, and I'm sure, you know, people listening to your podcast are getting really good information all the time. But once you go down this road, if you continue maybe to get those newsletters from eatwellmovewellthinkable.com, what's going to happen is your paradigm will shift like ours has Ari. And once you get that and the light comes on and you start to make these better choices and learn this, the knowledge and skills you require, which you're all capable of doing. This is grade two level stuff. Honestly, it's not complicated. Maybe there's a few fancy words here and there and, and how we explain it. But the, the, remember, our ancestors were way healthier than we were and they didn't know what a cell was. They, they, you know, they, they didn't know any of this. They just were taught how to eat, move and think. And the one thing that we have now that is not passed on from generation to generation, the reason why we see our elderly is almost obsolete rather than as the highest valued members of our culture, which was always the case with humans until recently, is because we have now been, been, been um, convinced, fraudulently convinced to look outside of our family as experts of how we should eat, move and think and how to live a good life because our that knowledge was taken away from them and it was put into the hands of people who wanted to sell it back to us. But the reality is the reason the elderly were so uh, um, so important in culture is because they had a lifetime of accumulation of teaching people how to live a great life. Right. And those things don't change with time. You don't, the, 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 how to use a cell phone or whatever these things that, that, that rapidly change with culture. The thing that does not change with culture 
that's the same today as it was 20,000 years ago is what humans need to eat, move and think in order to express health and happiness. And so become those parents to your kids and become those kids to your parents so that we can take this all back to ourselves where it belongs and pass this very simple, easily acquired knowledge on and skill set on so that we can take our health back. Beautiful. I love it. Dr. Chestnut, thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you, Ari. Me too. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next